So you've been writing the comics for Dynamite. You've been writing the comics ever since it went off the air, continuing the story. So now we have Gargoyle's Quest. So what is what does this add to the long, amazing saga of the Gargoyles? Uh, well, I, it's a big story. It's an event. Um, Demona has a a, a game plan. Um, and she's got allies, uh, and she is planning to steal the three keys to power, the three new keys to power, because we dealt with the original three keys in the old TV series. Mm -hmm. Um, and the idea is that when those three keys were destroyed in three different ways, um, nature and even the nature of magic abhors a vacuum. And so all that power flowed into three new totems, uh, or not necessarily new totems, but three other totems. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, she has been able, uh, with the last remaining spell from the Grimora Marcanorum, to identify these three totems. And once she uh, learns what they are and learns the nature of them, she comes up with a plan first to take these items and then to uh use them against the human race because you know that's her thing <laughs> that's right that's right yeah we so you know she's on a quest for three items which is a classic i mean it's called gargoyle's quest when you know obviously if you're a fan of gargoyles what makes this so uh multi-level is just the fact that there's this incredible world that exists for these characters. It's so detailed. So, so just in in this interview, I mean, we should just throw in there that you know, uh, I worked on Gargoyles almost thirty years ago when it was airing on Disney Adventures, and I was doing the comics for Disney Adventures magazine. Mm -hmm. And yes, so uh, which was, uh, and of course, I, you know, did all these series. And when the Gargoyles Bible came in, I was like, holy, holy cow! We got a lot to work with here. So, um, and uh, obviously, you know, the show got canceled, all that happened, but uh, the, you have never left the, the Gargos flame has always been burning in your castle. Um, so I guess with this, with this, this story, I, I, I mean, I, my question for you now is like, how much of the, of these stories that you're telling right now, did you have in the back of your mind all along when did when when did you when did these ideas begin brewing for what you're writing now for gargoyles uh i i don't want to pretend like oh i had these scripts in my pocket and i just pulled them out that's not the right. case but um in terms of the the ideas behind them i've had uh not all of them but most of them for yeah like you know 29 well not 29 because that's when we just started <laughs> but uh but you know 20 plus years, you know, I've been keeping, uh, I have uh, comp books, you know, the black and white. Uh, I have comp books like this uh, filled with Gargoyle's ideas. I just never stop. you know, I, something would occur to me or I'd be reading something, I don't know, for Young Justice or, or just on my own. I go, oh, that'd be good for Gargoyles. And I would put it down in it in the comp book the the bad news for me is that, that those ideas are not organized in any way shape or form so i'm constantly right. like going okay i know i thought of something here where do i find it in these right. comp books um and some of it i've got on you know i've got a timeline thank god uh you know a a, a word file because i can't mm. imagine trying to do the timeline by hand but uh, <laughs> but you know i've got i've got uh you know just a ton of material to draw from. And the great thing about Gargoyles from day one is that, you know, we never ran out of ideas. The, the problem with, um, if you want to call it a problem, but the problem even back in the day on the show wasn't, oh my God, how are we going to do 65 episodes? It was, which stories, you know, do we want to pick? Um, and, uh, and so it became this thing where, all right, at any given moment, we're picking the best 
stories that we have in our arsenal, but not the only ones. Right. Um, and that's still the case now. In other words, I've got, you know, on one level, I've in essence got uh, hundreds of potential story ideas to draw from. And so at any given moment, you're combining two things. One, you're you're combining um, what are Dynamite's and Disney's needs because they weigh in, believe me, um, in terms of what they're looking to publish. Mm -hmm. And then given those needs, I'm like, okay, what's the best story in my arsenal? And there are certain things where I'm like, well, but this is set 10 years later. I can't use this one. Or this is set, this is a, a great story, but it's a flashback. Do you want to do a flashback? And with Gargoyles Dark Ages, they were like, yeah, let's do it, you know, kind of thing. Um, but, you know, uh, it's got to fit the needs of the, in essence, the project. But in any scenario that, that Dynamite can come up with, I've got lots of options about what I could do mm -hmm. next. And, um, and with Nate Cosby, who's my editor, we just sort of um, talk it out a bit. Uh, you know, we're, we're, vis-a-vis -vis the readers, we're about two steps ahead. So that allows me time to lay pipe for things that are coming, uh, that I know are coming right. down the road. And, you know, um, right now the book, I'm told, is selling really well. The main Gargoyles title and Dark Ages is also selling well. And we have high hopes for Quest. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, you know, if, if that changes, then... and. I, I hope I don't ever want to stop, but it, it, if it stops someday, then we'll have told the best stories we had to tell for that given period of time. And the same was true back when we did the SLG comics. And the same was true back when we did the te television series at any given moment. I'm telling the best stories I have in my arsenal for the scenario, the sort of business scenario right. that we're in. Um, so, you know, for SLG, it was telling, a gargoyle story and they wanted a spinoff and we chose bad guys for uh dynamite we're telling gargoyles and they wanted a spinoff and we chose dark ages and now we're sort of as those two series come to an uh a conclusion of their specific arcs we're taking a bit of a a breather to do this event with quest that will um change a lot of things uh in uh the quote-unquote modern Gargoyle Universe, which is, of course, right. 1997. Right. Uh, right. Um, yeah. Well, that's the best year. Actually, 1997 is the best year ever in human history. You got to, you know, really, it, <laughs> it, it peaked. If you think about it, honestly, it was, it, things have been downhill since then, as far as I'm concerned, aside uh, from the internet, but maybe not. Um, and, you know, well, for Quest, you also, let's face it, Devona is a fan favorite character. And oh, yeah. um, so it's, you know, and, you know, she was, she didn't, you just reintroduced her uh in the series so you know she was kept off screen for a while and now she's back so um i mean that's got to be a pretty yeah and she's tool. she's back with a vengeance I mean, she, is, there, she can't um, be back any other way let's be honest right yeah so you know it's uh i just uh just for the sake of checking for my own benefit i just pulled up the gargoyles timeline it's 389 pages word document um oh my god oh. so you know i got stuff and some of the stuff on the timeline is obviously things that um, were episodes of the show or issues of one of the other comic series, but um, some of it are events that I know need to happen. And so I've already put them in the timeline. Other things I add as I do each issue, you know, because again, it's not like I literally had scripts sitting there. I had yeah. ideas, not scripts. And so, you know, as the details come out, I add those to the timeline. And so it's a constantly evolving, growing. Well, that's document. I guess that's what I that's what I wanted to get at too. You know, and, and just to point out, you know, you're like Rose and Titanic. You know, it's not like you you never had anything else in your life. You know, you after Gone Girls was canceled, the original, you went out and did all sorts of cool things. So it's right. not like you've just been sitting in your your room writing in your notebooks about gargoyles for uh, for 25 years, which I think is important to bring up because obviously you've been yeah, so I've been much. busy. Yes, you've been very busy. Um, but yeah, I, I I guess the question is to me like, do you still keep finding out things about these characters and about this world and and, and about about their history? Oh, definitely. Um, I make discoveries all the time. Um, 
certain things surprise me. I mean, the thing about that was true about gargoyles from almost literally day one is that uh, we would, I mean, a perfect example, for example, uh, this is a 28 year old spoiler, but uh, is the fact that Owen is Puck, right? Mm -hmm. So we were working on this story um, and called uh, one episode called The Mirror. And um, suddenly, and we knew oh, there was some secret about Owen, but we hadn't quite we figured out what that secret was. Um, and we knew, and we were introducing this character Puck and suddenly it hit me that Owen was Puck. So I called up uh, Bryn Chandler Reeves and Lydia Morano who were working on The Mirror. And I said, listen, listen, I just, it just hit me. Owen is Puck. And they're like, we know. <laughs> it was like, I mean, in other words, Gargoyles has always been, one thing that's always been special about it is that the characters tell us where they want to go next. I mean, it, it just, it, it feels so right that I literally can't help feeling and I know how cliche this sounds, but I mean, I really know, believe me, but it feels like there's a Gargoyles universe out there that we're, that uh, I and, and others who worked on the show are tapping into, that um, I'm, that I'm telling stories that actually happen um, uh, because things seem to always come together and fit so right you know, I'll have an idea for a story and then I'm actually sitting down working on the script and I'll be like, oh, I know who's walking through the door now. It's this person, mm -hmm. of course, you know, um, and it's like. Uh, it's like. That's the only way it could have been. Um, we're constantly and by we, I mean, me and uh, Nate and um, uh, Drew on Dark Ages and George on. Uh, on the main series and now Pasquale on uh, Quest, we're adding, you know, new characters. We are constantly changing the situation. And one thing that we always tried to do with Gargoyles and I continue to try to do is that there's no status quo for this series. Mm -hmm. um, that um, the lives of our characters are constantly in flux that, um, that, uh, you know, we think they live in the castle. No, nope, we're moving to the clock tower. No, nope, we're blowing up the clock tower. Now they're back in the castle. There's no guarantees uh, who lives, who dies, where they are, what the relationships are. Everything is organic and in flux. Um, I mean, I'm not going to do anything like that pulls someone way out of character or anything like that, but or even a little out of character. Um, and I do have the advantage for most of the characters that um, our voice cast was so strong for the original show that when I'm writing Goliath or Elisa or Brooklyn or any of them, mm -hmm. uh, Demona, Lex, Broadway, you name it, Hudson, I hear their voices in my head. I know what they sound like. Um, and even with new characters, I sort of mentally cast them <laughs> in my head. Um, and, uh, and go from there, the idea being that these characters have strong voices, strong points of view. Um, they're all unique characters to me and they tell me what they wanna do next. I, uh, I try to keep my authorial meddling out of it, you know? <laughs> well, that's, that, I mean, that's obviously the best way when it just, you know, I mean, it is true. All the characters speak to you, you know, they speak through you. Um, I want I want to do talk a little bit like just about uh, you know people who who say the Gargoyles show was ahead of its time. I mean, I I don't think it really was ahead of its time. I, I mean, it, it yes, of course it was in some ways, but it really also was of that time. You know, like we did see the beginnings of peak TV. We did see the beginnings of you know shows that had these long involved storylines, continuing storylines. I mean, all that existed in the 90s and um i mean i think what gargoyles was was something very bold for what disney was doing certainly on the disney afternoon it was a huge 
risk. But I mean, can you just talk a little bit about about that, you know, perception or, you know, am I wrong or, or what do you think? Uh, modern television for me starts with Hill Street Blues, um, which was an 80s show, not a 90s. You'll, you'll get no argument here on that. <laughs> um, uh, you know, and, and uh, I am, you know, what Stephen Bochco did with that series and everyone else who followed and the, and the list of people who worked on Hill Street is like a, um, you know, a who's who of writers and showrunners. Um, and then you can go forward from there to the people they worked with on shows that they worked on afterwards and everything comes out of Hill Street. Mm -hmm. And certainly what comes out of Hill Street is this idea uh, of a two things. One, that um, not everything can be wrapped up neatly in a half hour or an hour. And two, um, the idea that status quo television can be incredibly dull. Um, and look, we all love procedurals. We all love to, to you know, all right, just solve the murder. Um, <laughs> but isn't it better if we solve the murder and at the same time we see some growth out of the characters who are regulars in our show? Um, and all that, from my point of view, unless literally you want to go to soap operas, because that's really where that comes from. But Hill Street took that and did it with uh, uh, meaning and intention and uh, thought and power and dealt with real world issues. And I'm not saying soap operas never. I watched all my children for <laughs> 30 years before right. it finally went off the air. Sorry, someone outside has got a lawnmower going <laughs> and I can't uh, yeah. hear myself think, but uh, um, like right outside my window. Um, but, and Hill Street Blues was a major inspiration for Garland. I mean, very much so. Um, and no, I don't think we were the first or the only but I do think in terms of um, what was being done in afternoon cartoons, let alone Saturday morning cartoons, which were even geared younger uh, than afternoon shows. Um, I think there were a lot of things we did that were particularly unique. And um, there are a bunch of things I could name. Um, I think that we were not ahead of our time in terms of diversity, but we were ahead of the curve in terms of what television was depicting of diversity right, right. Um, and I don't even take any pride in that in it because it's like this should have already been happening but at least I take some comfort again not pride but comfort in the fact that I didn't continue the incredibly dull tradition of let's just do a show about white males um, mm -hmm. and so we I, and and honestly, it was selfish. I was just bored with that. I was personally bored with that. I'm like, I lived in New York for years. Let's show the New York that I remember, not the New York that somehow only has white men in it and no one else. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that New York and, doesn't exist unless you're at like the, you know, the tech bro hangout here, unless you're right. at so Soho it, House, it was I just guess. like. <laughs> So that was part of it. Um, but another aspect I think was our villains. One thing that I was, you know, look, and my background like yours is in comic books. Um, I had worked as an editor at DC Comics uh, for years and then as a freelance writer um, doing Captain Adam and other things for them. Um, one thing that I was really bored with were petty villains. Like the the villain who um, whose minion comes in and said the, the hero defeated me. And so the villain, you know, kills the minion. You failed me. Mm -hmm. Boom. You're dead, you know? And I'm like, I'm like, right. wait, dude, you've never succeeded in defeating the hero. So why are you taking it? So one thing that we really worked on that I am really proud of is I think in Demona and Xanatos, we created two, certainly for cartoons, um, truly unique 
villains. Um, and uh, something different um, that you hadn't seen in cartoons before. Now, I think Demona probably, at least subconsciously, owes a little in my head to Magneto. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I wasn't conscious of it at the time, but I people have brought that up and I, I'm like, I can see that. And certainly I was a comic book geek. I knew Magneto. So I'm sure that was in the soup, you know, but still from a cartoon standpoint, her uh, arc, um, her tragedy, which is largely self-created, um, but not entirely, um, you know, that was something that you had not seen. And Xanatos is complete disinterest in being a villain right you know right his interest was in meeting his own goals and in and creating scenarios where uh uh no matter what the result was he'd win um you know but he wasn't interested in vengeance he wasn't trying to destroy the world the world had suited him very very well you know, he was a very rich man. He came from, uh, I wouldn't say poverty, but he came from, you know, uh, a lower income class. His dad was a fisherman, um, uh, an immigrant from Greece who uh, ended up in Maine. Um, and this was a guy, he liked the world. What can I do with it now? You know, um, and that I think was also tremendously unique. And then, you know, I want to give credit to, our artists, the writers who worked on it. Um, I, I don't ever want to make it sound like I was a one-man band. And without a doubt, when you look at those two villains, you have to look at Marina Sirtis's work as Demona and Jonathan oh. Frakes's work as uh, Xanatos and Jamie Thomas and our voice director's work yeah. directing them. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, I, I, I got to throw in here just real fast. You know, I, I interviewed Marina one time at a con. My God. I just say this. She's a pistol. <laughs> well, I mean, what was fun for us <laughs> Truly, and it's still fun for me to this day because uh, I love Marina dearly. Uh, and uh, is that Marina went not Marina was playing the nicest person in the galaxy, um, mm -hmm. on yeah, Star Trek The Next Generation, and she went from that, and then you know, she and and Next Generation was still going while we were making Gargoyle. So then she would come over and get to play Nasty. And right. if you ask her, she'll cop to this. She has much more in common with Demona than she does with Deanna. Well, I didn't uh, want to say that, but... Um... She said it. I mean, I'm I'm like quoting. Right? Um, yeah. And, and, you know, it's... So she got Demona. And, yeah. and Jonathan was just you know, so charming as Xanatos that, you know, you knew he was the the antagonist, you knew he was the bad guy, and yet he was so charming, it was right. impossible to hate him. You just love the guy, you know? Um, and again, that's a credit to the writers, to the artists, uh, and to the actors, but it was also the goal from day one. That And as you said, you've read the Bible that I wrote so many years ago. Um, and that's that attitude is in the Bible for both those characters. And, yeah. and oh, yeah. uh, is so, you know, we set out to do some things that were different and primarily Frank Parr, Michael Reeves, um, Carrie Bates, Gary Sperling, Bryn Chandler Reeves, Lydia, uh, Dennis Woodyard, Bob Klein, all of us who worked on the show and I'm leaving out thousands. Um, you know, set off to make a show that we would want to watch. And we were like, let's us be really passionate about this show, do something that we would really love, and then cross our fingers that that people agree with us. Be and that is the that lesson which I which we was the game plan on gargoyles has fueled my entire career. I've got to make yeah. stuff that I'm passionate about and then hope to hell that there are fans out there who agree but if i'm not passionate about it how can i expect anyone out there to get passionate about it if, if i'm just like oh, okay here's this then well the, i think that well, shows absolutely you know that actually echoes something um i was talking to chris garmont 
at Baltimore Comic Con and, uh, you know, talking, I was a huge X, X-Men fan as a teenager growing up. Those were my comics. But anyway, he just said, if we weren't having fun, how was the reader going to have fun? And, right. um, you know, I could certainly talk about, you know, fun and passion uh, in today's world. But, you know, I do have to ask you, Greg, as a, you know, now let's rock it forward into the uncertain world of 2023. I mean, you know, I feel like we just started a whole new chapter. I feel like, you know, it's issue one of a new miniseries called Hollywood, you know, 2023. Um, you know, the strikes have ended. All of a sudden, all this news is well, gushing. One strike's at ended. Us. I'm not sure well, if the second strike's ended. Well, we'll see. We'll see. And then, you know, there might be a, uh, isn't it, uh, IATS, uh, you know, the, the IATSE strike also. So yes, the, the t- period of, of union labor, uh, you know, disruption is definitely upon us. Um, so, y- you know, what's, uh, how did we get out of this? Or, you know, what's the, uh, you know, what would be your game plan in this uncertain, crazy world? You know, what's your take on it? I know that's a really horrible oh, wow. question, but I think yeah, you know I mean, what I, I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, don't in any way want to pretend to be an expert in this sort of thing. I mean, my experience is uh, there's just a lot of fear. Um, uh, I'm uh, I'm not in the Writers Guild. I'm in the Animation Guild. I'm also in SAG. Um, I am uh, not sure the SAG strike's settled, even though the WGA strike is settled. Um, it's got to go up for ratification and um, Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of arguments against ratifying this agreement. Um, And I haven't honestly decided yet which way I personally am gonna vote. Um, So I don't know if that's settled yet, but in any case, even before, and you're right, the Animation Guild strike, Animation Guild's part of the Yahtzee uh, is coming up next summer. Uh, and let me tell you something, I mean, relative to, you know, writers in animation get nothing relative to writer, what the writers guild, uh, forget what they have now post strike animation writers had nothing that compared to what the writers guild writers had free strike and, but I am pro union all the way. Um, and what I see at literally every studio and streaming service is a culture of fear. Everyone's afraid. We all come to town because we want to make stuff. I mean, I think almost without exception, everyone who sh- comes here and takes a job, whether they're creative or they're going on the executive side, it's still because they want to make stuff. They're in love with the idea of telling stories and they want to make stuff. Right. But then they right. get into these studios and these now these streaming services and um, and these this culture of fear takes over. And suddenly it's not about making stuff. It's about CYA. Um, it's about. Um, what if what we make bombs, then we'll, mm-hmm. we'll be fired, you know, um, so. <clears throat> what I see is a lot of places, and there are tons of exceptions, but a lot of people who are who are looking for reasons to say no as opposed to reasons to say yes. And that's a very different mindset. Right. I mean, we have I this really I'll go on. Sorry. Well, I, I just I you know, it's it becomes uh, a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy, and I and I don't know where we go from. It. Here. I mean, uh, you know, the when the two strikes hit, I expected that animation would have a bubble. Not that it would be permanent, but hey, Writers Guild is live action. Screen Actors Guild had a separate thing for animation, so the actors could still do voice work. They couldn't promote it, but they could still do it. I and. Um, so I thought, oh, well, we'll get a bubble for animation, but the reverse happened. And we wound up, everything just sort of froze up because all the studios were like, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't want to take a risk. Um, 
And so I'm hoping that this freeze will start to thaw, but I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, well, we uh, it's funny that we've just come through this era of saying yes to everything, and um, which obviously had some advantages, but, um, you know, created other problems. And so, yeah, everybody, it's it's a little bit like comics right now too. I mean, I think, I, I don't think it's just comics, just movies, just streaming, just TV, just everything is figuring out its way forward right now. Um, mm -hmm. in, in reaction to just, the, you know, all the changes that have happened. Um, I have to ask you, uh, okay, I know I, I need to wrap this up, but um, I just have to ask you though, uh, there was some talk, they did announce there might be live action gargoyles. I don't know what you can say about that. I can't say anything about that. Mm -hmm. I knew you couldn't, but I had to ask. Um, is okay. Anything else about Gargoyles Quest that we should know? Uh, no, I mean I've seen uh, uh, pencils on the first issue. They're gorgeous. Um, uh, I'm very excited about uh, what we have going and um, Pascal Lee's work and. Um, uh, and I'm in the midst of of writing issue two as we speak. I've written about half of the script and and uh, have about half to go. And and it's a very I think it's a really exciting story. So I just hope people pre order pre order pre order uh, pre order. That's, what That's one thing that hasn't changed. You need to pre order. Um. All right. So final question. Now I'm very pleased that Dynamite. I'm, you know, I'm good friends with Nick and everybody there. I'm uh, very happy that if they were going to do the, t you know, I, Greg, you got to understand, I've tapped all this Disney Adventures nostalgia in me, waiting for the time <laughs> when it would all come. I mean, I knew the time would come, so I was, I was ready. You know, I've been plotting all along. Uh, so the two things that I would have picked on the two cult books would have been Gargoyles and Darkwing Duck. So um, good, good call there. But when are they going to bring back? bonkers um you completely understand i have no input on that whatsoever. <laughs> i know but come on i doubt you i mean you worked on the bonkers tv show too right <laughs> well i did i worked on the uh, miranda wright version of ah. bonkers, um, which came first but aired second um right, right. and so the uh the Pickel version of Bonkers, uh, I, I didn't work on. Uh, Bonkers was a wonderful development process for me. And then as a production was somewhat painful <laughs> because of the shift um, and the reordering of everything. But uh, uh, I have a, a real soft spot in my heart for Bonkers. Um, I love Jim Cummings' performances, Bonkers. Oh, yeah, I love Jeff Bennett as uh, Jitters. Uh, I loved so much that from that point on, I'm like, I need Jeff Bennett in every single show I ever do. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, there was some there was some moments there, and I, I will say I have a big spot, soft spot for the Roger Rabbit verse. So you know, Toonville and all that. So I'm, I'm just saying that would be you know they did such an incredible job with Chip and Dale, Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers. I felt like I was seeing my life just put up on the screen, <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, when they did that that new version. So anyway, I'm just I, I just have to, uh, you know, from my mouth to God's ear, bonkers. I'm telling you, yeah, someone yeah. out there, bonkers. <laughs> it's a cop show. I mean, it's it. You know, comics could do that great. Uh, yeah. I uh, I think that uh, you know you could really, particularly with the art styles, in a way that in animation it would be a little tough. But you know, you could do a thing where Miranda is you know, drawn in a in a more human realistic, I don't necessarily mean photorealistic, but realistic style. And the tunes are tunes and you can create a greater contrast than I think we were able to create on the series. Yeah. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, you know, uh I mean, you know, it would and and with digital color, you know, there's so many things that could be done to, to create that contrast. Also, um, I think Bonkers is a would be a phenomenal um, 
TV series, I mean, comic book series. Um, <laughs> obviously, re- I have a intense preference for the Miranda version. Of, <laughs> of course, of course. Um, well, that, but, that's uh, the only good version. The Miranda version is the only good version. So well, that's I, not I, even, I, you I know. Do, there's some people who might argue with you. Uh, well, but in we'll any see. event, uh, I won't. <laughs> but, <laughs> Um, well but yeah i'd love to see that hell i'd love to write it but uh yeah well there uh, we go but you're too busy get back to work on gargoyles and gods or spider-man and all your other projects (laughs) great right (laughs) uh listen this is really great it's really fantastic to get a chance to talk to you and catch up and um you too so yes great and uh, everybody look out for gargoyles quest coming in 2024 all right thanks greg 